Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're talking with Dr. Mark Greenewald, professor and vice chair of family and community medicine at Carilion Clinic and Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine in Roanoke, Virginia, about the importance of creating intentional connection among physician colleagues in the wake of the pandemic. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's chief experience officer in Chicago. Well, Dr. Greenewald, I'm gonna put this issue of disconnection and isolation in the bucket of things that were bad before the pandemic and then got worse. Is that a kind of a, a correct characterization? Todd, you're right on target. The, the data showed that certainly physicians were struggling, care teams were struggling well before the pandemic and all the pandemic has done is exacerbated and added on to what already existed. I don't think a lot of people think necessarily of physicians and healthcare teams as being isolated. Can you talk a little bit first about, you know, what what goes into that? Why is there that problem? There's a there's a culture within both our selection as physicians in particular and also our training to be really ruggedly independent and in many ways to armor up not just around our patients but also around each other. A lot of posturing can go on professionally and so that becomes part of the culture. And so when physicians then find themselves in need of help, when care teams find themselves in need of help, often they're not quite sure where to turn or even how to turn to get that help. And I imagine the impact of that kind of isolation and feeling of disconnection is not good, not positive. No, it's not for any human being. We are, we are relational connection creatures. And so in healthcare in particular, knowing the issues that we deal with and really the emotional challenges as well as the physical challenges of what we go through every day in our work, it's essential that really no one cares alone when it comes to this important work that we do. So tell me, you know, now we've had a year under our belts with just, you know, uh, unimaginable stress uh, right. and isolation broad scale, but particularly uh, physicians being hard hit by this. What's been the impact of COVID on, on this problem? Well, the impact is that it took what was already a bad problem and really made it worse. A lot of physicians, I think, are feeling more isolated than ever. And in some ways, because physically and socially, we've been asked to isolate. We've distanced ourselves in ways that we never would have before. And even when we're together, we're disguised in many ways and covered up. And I think that that has gone over into our ability to connect with each other. A lot of our connection has been now electronic. And so we miss some really important cues when it comes to just connection, when we lack that ability to physically be present with each other. We've also then had had the, this whole phenomenon that I think has been exacerbated by COVID of, of something called moral injury or moral distress. This idea that, that we are violating some of our very principles in, in the context of caring for patients and just trying to navigate through the pandemic, which I think existed also before the pandemic, but has just been brought into the spotlight during this time that we've traveled over the last year. And is that just basically an issue, I mean, not basically an issue, but an issue of uh, how overwhelmed uh, healthcare worker and uh, have been physicians particular, when you think about at the height of the pandemic and uh, you know the inability to like kind of uh, respond to that level of uh, death and injury. Yeah, that, that whole sense of helplessness uh, the sense of, in some cases, depending on the geography of the physician, hopelessness, the feeling that I want to help these people and either I can't because we don't know what to do or I don't have the equipment to be able to do it or the resources or the staffing. So there's been so many complicated problems and challenges that have come about because of COVID in particular. You, uh, interestingly, were working on this problem before the pandemic and you yeah. had started a pilot a peer-to-peer -peer support program uh, back in 2019 to address these issues. Can you tell us the thinking behind the program and how it works? Absolutely. The, the, the program is called Peer Rx Med, and it was a program that I had actually been thinking about for a long time and just for whatever reason was not able to bring all the pieces together. But in 2019, we did a pilot just to see what kind of response we would get from physicians around this idea of proactive peer-to-peer -peer connection. There's a lot of peer support programs right now that are what I would consider more reactive. Once a physician needs help or reaches out for help, then help arrives in the context of either, either peer support or other support. This is a way to say, let's try to prevent the problems from happening in the first place. How do we provide people support so that both as they travel the challenges of healthcare 
they can do that with a professional colleague with them. But also then when they need help, they've also they've already established rapport with someone. And so they don't need to necessarily reach out to someone who they don't know. They can be more vulnerable with somebody who they've already established that relationship with and that connection with. And that was the vision behind PRX Med to start. What's the kind of time commitment that's involved in something like that? Yeah, it, it, physicians and others are always concerned about what will this take to do? And I designed it to be very simple. It, it, it essentially is every week for as little as 90 seconds just to connect with your buddy, which is what I call that your PRX buddy or your PRX colleague or partner, just to connect with them for as little as 90 seconds to say, how are you doing? What can I do to be helpful? What can I do to encourage you? What can I do to support you? What I find, of course, is that once those connections start to be made, you want to do much more than 90 seconds with this person because this person becomes an essential part of your week. And in many ways, part of your not just survival strategy, but thriving strategy as you work your way through your week. So uh, let me ask you, did you take your own medicine in this regard and experiment with the program yourself? Oh, absolutely. Some would say I'm overdosing. I actually have three PRX Med partners. Uh, I have a partner here locally, somebody who I work with and sees me working every day, somebody who I got to know through my through my work and well-being, who's in another city. And then a third person who's one of our community, uh, our community physicians here, to just to get a sense of what they're going through in those different in those different contexts and different workplaces. So what I've learned from that is that for me personally, having this person as as someone who's accompanying me on the journey has just been a lifesaver that I find many, many times things that I wouldn't have talked about, things I would have stuffed, that instead I realize I'm going to get a chance to talk to my PRX partner this week, and I'm going to go ahead and share this with them. And in many cases, I can't wait to share this with them. What I've also found, of course, is the other side, which is they call me on things when I share with them something I'm going through, and they say, how are you doing? And I say, I'm doing fine. And they say, no, wait a minute. No, you can't just be doing fine with that. Let's talk about that a little bit more. And again, things that historically I would have just I would have just buried and they would have come up in other ways are now things that I find myself addressing regularly. And these are things sometimes my wife is a physician and sometimes I found myself taking those things home. And what I've done now is to say, I don't want to take those things that are going to burden her. That's not what I want to talk about at the end of the day. That's not going to be uplifting for our relationship. So it's also provided me an opportunity to make sure I'm not trying to bring things home that need to be addressed in other places. What was the biggest surprise during your participation in the program? Few surprises. My biggest surprise for me personally has just been how comfortable it's been to open up to colleagues and develop rapport in a way that I hadn't before, including some things that have bubbled up that I'd actually forgotten about. What I've been encouraged by from others, even physicians who have historically felt that they were connected is they've shared with me how much they appreciate the nudge that they get every week because otherwise they would have known this was something they wanted to do, but they often would have neglected or forgotten about it in the busyness of our week. And so what they do is the way the program works is every Monday they get an email that I call the buddy check nudge that essentially says time for buddy check. Here's the, here's some information or something to think about. Here's two or three trigger questions when you check in, just in case that you ha- you want some things to talk about. And then I have a blog post that I do that provides some additional information for people who want to go deeper. But that's not necessary. It's really a matter of the nudge and then the check-in by phone, by text, by email. Uh, there are lots of different ways that the buddies do it. Many do just by chat, and they do it multiple times a day just to say, buddy check, how you doing today? So it's been fun to watch the creativity of people once they've begun the process. The other piece, of course, is that many have stuck with the process now over almost two years. So that idea of the longevity of this, it's not something that you do for a while and say, I'm sick of being supported. It's something that people have appreciated and continue to appreciate as they go along. I imagine that the structure, too, is important because I've you know participated in buddy systems before where it's kind of like... Yeah more informal or catch as catch can, so to speak, but having that structure in there, it's something you look forward to, you know, you're being counted on. I guess that that is important. It really uh, has been important, yes. And and the, the idea of knowing that somebody is going to be checking in or we're going to be checking in, what I've found many people sharing with me is they look not only look forward to it, but they save things to say, I know I'm going to be seeing my buddy on Friday and I can't wait to make sure that I talk about this particular thing with them. 
So processing things in a way that hasn't been done before for many physicians. You know, uh, I mean, the physician burnout has been a huge problem. It's why the AMA spends a lot of time and energy uh, really looking at the root causes of that, many, many, uh, most of which are kind of systems problems uh, that we work on trying to uh, address. But, you know, this issue of peer-to-peer -peer support uh, and uh, correcting, I guess, that sense of isolation, is that a relatively new component of the wellness effort? And how's it kind of fit in with the overall structure of wellness programs? And so, Todd, the, the, the whole idea of peer support, of course, is nothing new. The initial, many of the initial peer support programs that have been popularized and written about in the medical literature are what I, what I call reactive peer support programs, things like a second victim program, where once something happens, then we have a structure in place to reach out to you and say, hey, are you okay? We have this resource for you in case you'd like to talk to somebody. What's really been lacking, though, is a more formalized process for connection. And in, in the, quote, old days, I have to be careful about that, but I do have a few gray hairs. In the old days, there was the, the, the doctor's lounge. And many of the things that, that we do that we don't do now happened in the doctor's lounge very organically. In most organizations, those don't exist anymore, or they serve a very different function because many of the attractors to the doctor's lounge was to finish your records. And we, of course, can do that from anywhere now. And so in many ways, this picks up the need that has always historically existed, but allows it to be structured in a way that our very fast-paced and unstructured medical lives would just neglect. Um, so uh, not surprisingly, and I think you referenced this before, a uh, problem that existed before and then enormous problem now coming out of the pandemic. How do you take a program like this uh, and kind of formalize it and scale it to help address what is a really big challenge now in the aftermath of the pandemic for physicians? Absolutely. And I think that that there are many different approaches Part of the reason I created this program as I did is it's totally scalable because it's very easy to do. The structure is that I don't assign buddies. People come with their buddy on the website. There are opportunities for people to understand. So how do I do that if I don't have somebody who's obvious for me in terms of a connection? Many people have connected with old medical school or residency friends and, and connected that way. Many also connect within their own health systems. And so my hope is over time, health systems will adopt this as part of a program for peer support and part of their program for both promoting and enhancing clinician and care team well-being. But this is only a part, Todd, and I think that's an important thing for all the listeners to understand, is that uh, there's more to addressing this multifactorial, and as you point out, very systemic challenge that we have with clinician and care team distress. And so the combination of all those pieces coming together are really going to be what's going to start putting some kind of progress in, in what has been a really challenging problem. Now, I know you've been uh, working with the AMA as part of the uh, Steps Forward yes. webinar series to address physician burnout, uh, and you can find out more about that uh, on uh, AMA and at the AMA Ed Hub. If somebody wants to find out more about your program, do you have a site you'd like to refer them to? Absolutely. So it's PeerRxMed, P-E-E-R-R-X-M-E-D dot -E -E org or dot com. Either one will get you there. Uh, and, and as I said, it's a, this is a totally free program. It will always be free. Uh, and I, I do it because it's for the love of the game and really for the support of my colleagues. We all have stories about why it is that we have passions around the things that we do. And I've had many instances over my career where I could have really used a buddy, but ultimately found myself feeling very alone, sometimes by my, my own doing by pushing people away as they ask for support. And so the idea of having that built in for me became very important. And I think that's gonna be part of the key for people as they go forward. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Greenwald, Greenwald for all the work that you're doing and for you know, putting some action behind taking care of your fellow physicians. That's it for today's COVID-19 update. We'll be back with another segment shortly. In the meantime, for resources on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us, please take care.